So uh, good morning and good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Jan de Geer and I'm the director of uh, uh, Matrix. So before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land uh, I live and work on here in Melbourne. And I would also like to re uh, pay respect to their elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who may be present here. Uh, today we are very pleased to have Professor Michael Jordan uh, from UC Berkeley uh, as a speaker. Um, just want to point out that his appointment is split across the Department of Statistics and the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at uh, Berkeley. Uh, Michael has a uh, sort of minor Australian connection in that he has been on the board of the ASC Center of Excellence, ASIMS, um, uh, that, that supports uh, Matrix as well. Uh, he's one of the most influential computer scientists and statisticians and um, just as an illustration, he's a member of the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, and member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So just to set the scene. Uh, today, he will speak about optimization with momentum, variational Hamiltonian and symplectic uh, perspectives. And uh, before we start, I also like to acknowledge the sponsors of Matrix, the Australian National University, Monash University, and the University of Melbourne, and of course, the ASC Center of Excellence, ASIMS. All right, uh, that's it for me. I just want to hand over to Michael. And uh, you know, if you're interested in these series, there's a few upcoming uh, series in August, September, October, and November. And you can see the uh, future speakers on your screen. Okay, over to you, Michael. All right, thank you very much, Jan. Um, I can't share screen yet. You need to turn that over to me. There we go. All right, so it's my pleasure to be joining you all the way halfway across the world. Um, although I recognize much of my audience will not necessarily be halfway across the world. Uh, it's really a pleasure of this era to be able to feel so connected worldwide, um, talking about uh, mathematics and intellectual topics. Um, so my title there gives a sense that um, um, I'm, I'm going to be discussing on a you know, very technical material and uh, to some level, yes, but there's really a simple idea behind it. Uh, I'm really going to focus on optimization, which is a lingua franca among many, many fields. Uh, certainly us statisticians, a large fraction of our theory comes from the fact that our estimators are defined as optima often. Some of our favorite ones are. Um, you know, economics is full of optimization principles and uh, obviously control theory and engineering and so on and so forth. So many, many communities have either fed optimization or taken from optimization over the years. Um, and I'm going to be asking some mathematical questions about optimization um, that have a heritage in the physics literature and mathematics literature, um, but there was some topics kind of not, not investigated very much. And the question is going to be, is there a notion of an optimal way to optimize? Okay, so hopefully it'll become clear during the talk why one would ask such a question. But I hope you kind of agree, prima facie, it's an interesting mathematical question to ask. Is there a notion of an optimal way to optimize? Um, so just a little bit about why I work on this topic. Um, I am been fundamentally in my career interested in the bridge between computation and statistics. The fields somewhat came up separately over the last centuries. Uh, but in the minds of people like von Neumann or Kolmogorov, et cetera, I don't think they were separate. Um, inference and deductive inf uh, things were allied. Um, and, uh, you know, statistical procedures are algorithms, and we have to think about how long they take if we're going to really do statistical inference in the real world. So there's a whole I interest in uh, trade-offs between inference and computation. Uh, most recently, I've done a lot of work in economics and uh, bringing in this perspective on trade-offs that comes from economics where inference and computation um, meet up with um, economic trade-offs. Um, so in this uh, defining these trade-offs and understanding them quantitatively, optimization has been key. Uh, it's provided a real computational model of how complex something is, how long it takes. Um, and you'd be thinking that computer science would have provided that model, but really not so much. And it's largely because computer science uh, with the Turing machine aimed at very, very broad notions of computation, in some sense, almost too broad for our purposes. They, they don't give um, useful lower bounds on computational complexity. Um, now, on the other hand, optimization has continued to thrive mathematically, but also driven by this applied, these applied fields, in particular statistics. 
with millions of variables, millions of turns, all kinds of sampling issues, you know, non-convexity and so on. Um, these are not things that optimization and statistics have sort of jointly faced in the past. Um, so our current algorithmic focus that kind of gets us going on this topic uh, is to uh, see what we can do with the following ingredients. Uh, work with gradients. Um, so, uh, you know, historically optimization also worked with higher order operators like Hessians and so forth. Um, and we've really pretty much dispensed with those because at the scale we're working, computing a gradient is already quite complex. You have to maybe add up something over all the data points. Um, and if we had n squared operations just to form a Hessian, that would be kind of hopeless. Uh, similarly, we work with stochastic estimators because a full gradient might be impossible, but an estimate, um, it might be much cheaper computationally. So the trade-off makes us lean towards stochastics. And then we'll talk about acceleration as we go. All right, so here's a little bit of my outline. I may, may not get through all of this material, but just to give you a flavor of where we're going to go. Um, a lot of the focus here is going to be a non-convex optimization. The classical mathematical theories were convex. That was useful, got a lot of things started, but Real life is very much non-convex, and many of the most interesting estimators and uh, large-scale procedures um, that are in uh, current vogue are non-convex, and we want to start to face that. So we'll talk about that. And then I'm going to start to bring in the physics perspective, and the key issue is that we're going to go into continuous time. Optimization theory has almost always been done in discrete time, and I'm going to show you that that has a very severe limitation. You can't perceive certain of the fundamental phenomena having to do with optimization if you stay in discrete time. They, they come out much more clearly in continuous time, especially notions of lower bounds. And having gotten that, we'll bring in some probability theory and start to see that uh, ideas developed in the deterministic optimization world also have their counterparts in the stochastics world. Uh, this was a first paper about, I think, three or four years ago now that got a lot of the work uh, in my group and my little subfield started here. Uh, recognized co-authors, Chi Jin, uh, most notably, who's a student with me, now professor at Princeton. Um, and we were interested in non-convex optimization. We wanted to talk about um, uh, saddle points in particular and focus on saddle points. Why? Well, um, many, many modern statistical models yield non-convex optimization problems, certainly uh, neural networks. Um, but there's many other problems that have got even a single global optimum, uh, but rings of saddle points. So problems involving like phased retrieval uh, have that sort of property. Um, many kind of combinatorial structures have that property. There's a good global minimum, but it's ringed around by many, many saddle points. And it's hard to get past the saddle points, all right? Um, so saddle points in small numbers of dimensions aren't really a big deal. And here's a kind of picture of, of them. Um, you just kind of arrive at the saddle point and then fall off the side. But think about this as in millions of dimensions. And so we are in millions of dimensions in modern problems. Um, so you arrive at the saddle point with a gradient method, so you don't even know you're at a saddle point. Things are just kind of slowed down, and you want to get out, um, but there are millions of dimensions, and maybe there's only one direction that goes out. It's not even a dimension, it's a direction. So how do you find it? And is it exponentially complex to find it? Would it take sort of forever? And if our problem instances get larger and larger, are you going to really run aground because of these saddle points? Um, so this has emerged as one of the key problems uh, as time has gone on, uh, can we talk about efficiency vis-a-vis -vis gradient based methods in the presence of saddle points? Okay, so we're not doing full global non-convex optimization. It's still local, but not so local. We're willing to get past the saddle points to move towards something better down the hill. All right, so the background of that particular line, this particular line of work was uh, also pretty recent, um, at least in discrete time. So we had a paper um, showing that gradient descent will asymptotically avoid saddle points. It's kind of basically Morse theory and done in discrete time. Um, so that sounds positive, but asymptotics is just not the t tool of the day. Uh, asymptotics could be forever, so we're not necessarily interested. In fact, we had a, 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 a negative result around the same time, which showed that gradient descent can take exponential time to escape saddle points, exponential in the dimension of the problem. So it really can, um, in the worst case, take a long time to get out of saddle points. Um, now, on the other hand, if you add a bit of stochasticity to gradient descent, um, it was known uh, by a really beautiful paper by Gu et al. in 2015 that you can get out of saddle points in polynomial time. So stochastics does this kind of miraculous thing of uh, taking you from exponential to polynomial. Um, so uh, computer scientists love this kind of result. You know, that's their uh, phase transition they're particularly interested in. 
Um, but in statistics, uh, we're not so necessarily interested in polynomial time. It could be polynomial, could be dimension to the 45th power, and that would be no good. Even dimension to the third power wouldn't be very good if we're in hundreds of thousands or millions of dimensions. And in fact, we know that stochastic gradient ascent tends to work in those scale problems. So it, it, it can't be d to the 45 and even d to the third. So what is it actually? Do we, can we start to pin this down? All right, so um, let's talk about optimization. Here's just uh, a reminder, or we're, we're gonna talk about minimizing a smooth function f. Um, and and it, uh, sometimes it'll be convex for me to get started, but mostly it's gonna be non-convex. And there's gradient descent with a step size uh, that we choose by some method. So in the convex case, um, I'm sure the audience all knows this algorithm will converge. It'll converge to a global minimum. Um, but you may or may not be aware of a key fact. It, the number of iterations to arrive at that minimum is independent of the dimensionality. It's a beautiful fact about gradient descent that this is true. Um, and, and it means that gradient descent can run in infinite dimensions and it takes just as many steps as in finite dimensions. So that already gives us a feeling there's some power uh, in gradient methods and maybe it was underappreciated. On the other hand, if we run gradient methods on this surface here, um, especially in very high dimensions, we might stay and we might hit a local maximum. We, we may spend a large number of time near a saddle point. Um, is that what really happens? Um, I'm going to skip that slide and move on to this. So a little bit of structure here. Um, uh, in, in all of this kind of theory that we do of gradient methods, we, we make some assumptions, uh, very weak, but we assume that the function is, is smooth, i.e. it has a Lipschitz for the gradient. Um, and then we will want to arrive at a stationary point, which is not necessarily a global minimum, but in this case for convex, it would be a global minimum, uh, where the gradient nearly vanishes. Uh, so the epsilon there is, of course, that we want to solve this for all epsilon. We have a ball around the stationary point. And if we do it for all epsilon, it tells us how fast we will approach that ball, i.e. we'll get a rate. So here's a classical result due to Nesterov and, and others in, 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 the, in, the, in the, the, the crucially important Russian school. Um, showing the convergence rate for uh, gradient descent in this for first order saddle points. And not getting into too many details here, but you see a one over epsilon squared. That's kind of a standard rate. Um, in the numerator, you see a Lipschitz constant and the initial distance to the optimum. And you see no other hidden constants. So this is a beautiful result. It's non-asymptotic. Um, there's no hidden constants and the, all the constants have meaning. Uh, and there's no dimension, there's no D here. Okay, so it is, that's a, the, there, here's a proof, or behind that theorem is a proof that gradient descent is dimension free in convex problems. Okay, let's move on now though to the non-convex case. We're gonna make a little bit more of a uh, smoothness assumption. We'll have a, a Hessian Lipschitz, and we wanna now arrive at not first order stationary points because those could be saddle points, that's no good. So we put a little more uh, requirement on the stationary point, we make it second order stationary meaning that we still have the gradient nearly vanishing, but also the minimum eigenvalue there is greater than or equal to zero. So we have a bowl shape. And instead of saying zero, we put ourselves a little bit of negative slop there um, so that we can again get a rate. And we don't get a new parameter here. We use the row and the epsilon from the rest of the problem. So um, we don't have to get a new parameter. We want two parameters. We just want one, epsilon. Okay, uh, in this paper, we analyzed really the simplest possible algorithm that we could think of that might have some hope of giving a decent rate. So this, let's call this perturbed gradient descent. It's just gradient descent, if you'll see down there on line four. Um, but on line three, we're gonna occasionally add uh, uh, a perturbation. We're gonna add noise from a uniform distribution of a certain size around the current iterate. And the theory will tell you what size that ball will be. And you'll do it sporadically, at least in this first paper, we did it sporadically. Uh, later, we didn't do it sporadically, but here we did. And here's a theorem. Um, so again, let me not to get to all the details, but I've really out, uh, laid out most of the symbols here. Um, turns out the rate for non-convex problems of perturbed gradient descent is basically very much like gradient descent. It's one over epsilon squared. So we don't lose anything in this non-convex world um, if we're asking for second order stationarity. That's pretty interesting and surprising. Moreover, we have a Lipschitz constant initial distance to the optimum. So the only difference here is that little twil tittle tilde sign uh, where we traditionally hide the dimension dependence. But here we worked out the dimension dependence and it was logarithm to the fourth power of D, okay? Um, I don't believe that four, I think that's an artifact of the proof, but it's been now three or four years and we have not made the four go away. And you'll probably see why when I allude to the proof here. But critically, it's not exponential in D, but it's not even polynomial in D. Um, it actually is all the way down to logarithm. 
All right, so this is one of the first indications of why stochastic gradient is so effective in very, very high dimensions, hundreds of thousands of dimensions, uh, because its complexity is logarithmic in the dimensionality. All right, I want to just allude to the proof technique here because it's pretty, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it uses probability theory. It uses a coupling argument. Um, and this has happened in many, many of our more recent papers. We just kind of got enamored of the, of the idea. Uh, and effectively what it's doing is that it's obviating having to do a lot of geometry uh, by using probability theory. So the, the probability theory is serving in, in place of differential geometry analysis, um, which doesn't mean that one shouldn't try to do differential geometry, but it just means that probability can give you some insights um, very directly. So here's the idea. That green region there is we're in the neighborhood of a saddle point, and there'll be some region where the flow is mostly towards the saddle point. All right, if you're outside of that, you'll see a negative eigenvalue and you'll flow away very quickly, but inside that you flow in. And again, this is high dimensions. The uh, green region is, uh, is not a slab because the Hessian is varying smoothly in this, in this re regime. So how thick is the slab? That's exactly the, that's the issue. Is that that's how long it's gonna take us to remain in this, to get out of the saddle point. And we, we figured that out by analyzing coupled diffusions. We started, um, you know, two diffusions at distance R apart. If R is very thin, uh, very small, um, then both of the diffusions are in the green region and they both flow towards the saddle point and they couple quickly. Um, if one of, if R is a little bit bigger, one of the diffusions will be outside of the green region and it'll fly away and you will never couple. So by analyzing a phase transition in the coupling time of two Brownian motions, you get an upper bound on the thickness of this slab. And that's how we got the logarithm to the fourth power of D. Okay, so that was a important first paper to kind of get going on notions of geometry and non-convexity and dynamics. Um, and then that raised a lot of other questions. Um, first of all, um, we had a very nice result there with no hidden constants and good dimension minutes. Are we kind of done? Is this the best you can possibly do? And now we're starting to get in this you know, optimal way to optimize kind of issue. Uh, when you start talking about that, you ask about notions of acceleration, because as Nesterov and others have shown us, accelerated methods, and I'll tell you what that means, allow you to achieve lower bounds and, and give algorithms which are arguably the best you can do for a certain class of problems. All right. So to start to get into an understanding of this, this is the second mathematical idea we needed along this story. Um, we uh, started to bring in uh, uh, continuous dynamics in particular, uh, Hamiltonian and symplectic perspectives have turned out to be critical here in this story. So let me again recognize two of the students who worked with me, uh, Andrew Ibasono on the left uh, and Aisha Wilson in the middle. Uh, Andre has just taken a faculty position at, at, um, at Yale and Aisha has taken a faculty position at MIT. Uh, and then Mike Betancourt also helped us along the way with some of the symplectic ideas here. Um, okay, so let me just make a sort of a generic remark about this. Um, uh, my perception of mathematical fields is that um, the most mature ones tend to use both differentiation and integration a lot, and they go back and forth all the time between them. So, you know, Lagrangian Hamiltonian perspectives uh, in physics, you have differential equations, but you have to also have integrals, um, and statistics has this, you know, saddle point expansions and so on, and the numerical disciplines like finite element analysis do. Uh, less mature fields either do only integration or differentiation. And so I think of optimization in this, in this uh, less mature category, uh, surprisingly. It's basically just differentiation. You will rarely see an integral sign in a paper on optimization. Uh, and so partly I'm arguing that should be changed. So let's go back to gradient descent, uh, written slightly differently here, because I'm gonna talk about a different literature. But we have gradient descent there um, with a step size now called beta. Um, and I'm gonna add a fact about this now, which is that uh, let's express the convergence rate now in terms of the number of steps k that you've gone through. So after k steps have gone, uh, uh, have, have taken place in the in setting of, of smooth convex optimization, I will be within a ball of size 1 over k of the optimum. So that's another way of expressing Nesterov's result. At some point, Nemirovsky and Yudin and others in, in, the, in Russia, ex-Soviet Union, ask, is this the best we can do? Uh, and what does that mean? Well, it's a complexity theoretic question. Um, but it's asking the best you can do in some machine. So it's asking about computational complexity. What machine? Well, if it was a Turing machine, it's sort of the lower bound would be sort of zero. You just look at the function description and hop to the optimum maybe. Um, but but Nemirovsky asked an interesting question, which is that let's make our machine be um, a machine that can look at gradients and only gradients 
but it can remember all previous gradients and it can step within the linear span of all previous gradients. Okay, so that includes like conjugate gradient and gradient descent, obviously, and, so, and, and a bunch of other algorithms. So it's not a uh, Turing complete machine. It's not everything, but it's a powerful machine. Uh, in that machine, Nemirovsky was able to prove that um, the, uh, there's a lower bound on gradient-based methods, which is one over k squared. So it's faster than classical gradient descent. So there was a gap. Does that mean it was a bad lower bound or that uh, you needed to get a better upper bound on, on creating descent, or maybe there was even a better algorithm? Um, seems surprising there should be a better algorithm. So gradient descent is steepest descent. If you're only looking at gradients, how can you do better? Um, but uh, it was a surprise and a beautiful fact that uh, you can do better. And so this algorithm is due to Nesterov, 1983. Um, this is called accelerated gradient descent. Uh, it has two parts. The first part, it's two equations, not just one. So second order dynamics. The first equation is gradient descent. And the second equation is a little is sort, of, sort of a rotation of the last two gradients. Okay. Um, now, this, uh, the analysis was equally important as just writing down the algorithm. And Nesterov showed that this, this had a convergence rate of 1 over k squared. So we've reached the lower bound. And uh, that's really interesting. Having done that, you kind of think, all right, you know, do we have a theory here that generalizes to do many other problems in, in optimization, non-convex maybe? Uh, what about on manifolds, Riemannian optimization? What about stochastics and so on and so forth? So in each of these cases, people have worked out by hook or by crook some form of accelerated algorithm and analyzed it and gotten some rates. But there really is not a generative field uh, emerged at this point of what does it mean to accelerate and how do you sort of do it systematically? Okay, um, so um, let me skip that slide. Um, so our argument's going to be that to get that general theory, you need to move into continuous time. All right, why? Well, if you're talking about hopping along a discrete set of points, as in classical optimization, it's not really entirely clear what you mean by hopping faster. Um, you need to embed yourself in a continuum to talk about hopping faster. Um, and if you're going to talk about the optimal way to optimize, you know, surely there's got to be some notion of a continuum um, under, underlying this. What's it mean to hop a, a across a set of points optimally? Um, all right, so we'll argue that further as I go, but um, let's look first at gradient descent. You know, as, as most of you probably know, um, gradient flow is the differential equation counterpart of gradient descent. Uh, it's an ODE. Uh, it goes down the gradient. Um, if I discretize it with a simpler Euler method, simple Euler method, I'll get gradient descent. Um, now you can also analyze gradient flow directly and ask what's its convergence rate? And it turns out to be for convex problems, one over T, just like one over K for the discrete version. So there's some relationship there. Now you can go to those two equations of Nesterov and take the step size to zero and say what differential equation pops out. Obviously it'll be a second order equation because it was two equations. Um, and here it is. So uh, Wei Ji Su and Boyd and Candice at Stanford uh, worked it out, and it turned out to be this little x dot plus 3 over t x dot, uh, x double dot plus 3 over t x dot equation. Okay? You can't solve it, but you can analyze some of its oscillatory properties. It, in fact, oscillates um, and get insight. But it's kind of a mysterious equation. Where is that coming from? Why that mysterious 3? That seems special. Is there an underlying principle that delivers this differential equation and would deliver similar differential equations for other problems. All right, so that's what we went after with Aisha Wilson and uh, Andre Wibisono. Um, and we came up with a, uh, a way to think about this. We came up with a Lagrangian. So there is an underlying energy principle behind that equation and lots and lots of other equations. Um, so here, uh, I'm gonna have to sort of speed up. I don't wanna get into all the details here. There's, there's several papers about this now, but just to say what this Lagrangian is, it's a time varying Lagrangian it has as its key first term that uh, d sub h, that's a Bregman divergence. There's the alpha, beta, gamma of t. Those are just uh, degrees of freedom that give us a family of algorithms and not just one algorithm. So uh, they're diffeomorphisms. Uh, but the key is that Bregman divergence. It's a distance measure. Um, and it's a distance between x where you currently are and x plus a time scaled x dot. So it feels like a bit of a kinetic energy of some kind. And in fact, in the definition of a Bregman divergence, which I've written there, you have to have an auxiliary function uh, to measure the distance. Uh, if, that, if you take that to be quadratic, um, then that Bregman divergence reduces to one half x dot squared. So it literally is a classical kinetic energy. And this whole thing looks like a time varying Lagrangian. All right, so what do you do with Lagrangians? 
Well, you stick them inside a variational calculus, um, you integrate, and you find the minimal path. Um, and then you uh, can write down, uh, take derivatives, and you can get a differential equation, which we've done at the bottom of the page here. This is a master differential equation, which we think of as characterizing um, acceleration in a range of problems. Um, uh, it has its second order, it has a damping term, and it has the third term that looks complicated, but it's just some geometry. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is that um, if you solve this differential equation for a particular choice of alpha and beta, which determine the rate, you will move along a certain path in the phase space. So if I say I want to move at rate 1 over t, which we know that gradient flow will do, I can plug in 1 over t, uh, actually logarithm of 1 over t, as alpha there, and I'll get out a differential equation, and it'll be exactly gradient flow. So I'll have rediscovered gradient flow, and I'll go along a certain path in the phase space. If instead someone says, I want to go at a faster rate, 1 over t squared, they can plug that into this master equation for the alpha of t will be 2 logarithm t, and out will come a different equation, and it will be the suboida candace equation or something similar. doesn't have to be exactly that. But it will go along the same path in phase space as the 1 over t uh, differential equation. That's interesting. So we've, we've captured some geometry in this expression, even though we're allowed to move at different speeds along the curve, 1 over t over 1 over t squared. And in fact, you can move at any speed you want. If I plug in uh, exponential rate here, I'll get a differential equation that no one's ever studied. Um, and if I were to solve it, I would move along exactly the same curve, but I would move at exponential speed. All right, now that's weird because we know we can't go exponentially fast in discrete time. All right, so what's happening here is that the phenomenon continuous time, the speed is not become the important part, it's the geometry. And we capture that by the path, which is captured by our Lagrangian. Right, And what must be happening is that when you go back to discrete time, you discretize the differential equation. It must be impossible to discretize the differential equation at some speeds, exponential, and at other speeds, there's a phase transition and you're, you, it is possible to discretize. Okay, um, skip that slide there. So a couple of years ago, these were, we viewed these as mysteries. Why is this phase transition happening? Um, and what happens when we arrive at a speed where we can discretize, and then how do we do it once it's possible? All right, so the last part of my talk is going to be about using symplectic uh, geometry and symplectic integration ideas to start to understand these mysteries. Um, so really what's going to happen here is that we're going to be able to find where does that phase transition occur, and how do we discretize, and so on. Um, and it's going to take a little bit of work. Um, and the, the material I'm going to tell you about now is really kind of think about as sufficient conditions for, all, all, for the math mathematics to go by, not necessary. There may be other ways to think about these problems, and I'm sure there are, um, but this is what we, are, we managed to come up with. Um, all right, so I, as we were going through this work, I remembered a class I had sit, sat in on when I was a young professor at MIT uh, on um, differential geometry and dynamics, and I learned at the end of the class about symplectic integrals. And I, I loved it, but never used it. Um, and it remained in my brain, however. Um, and if you haven't heard about it, let me briefly give you the spirit of it. Um, so the classical way of thinking about integrating a differential equation is that you form a vector field, and you put yourself somewhere in the vector field, and you slide along the vector at that point a little distance and, and move to some other point. And then you look at the vector at that point, and you keep going along. So you're integrating the vector field. In the late 1800s, uh, Hamilton, Jacoby, Poincaré, and others had another thought about this. They said another way to think about flow is not a single vector. Put a little triple of vectors at each point. And as you, as you flow along the dynamical system, that triple will shear in some way. But is there a way to flow such that that triple of vectors ha keeps a constant volume? All right. Now, volume is a determinant. Uh, and so we're putting a polynomial constraint on our flow. All right, um, so uh, that would be an interesting constraint to put in for discretization. You could ask, I'm gonna hop along the flow discreetly, uh, therefore incurring an error, but could I do it so that that polynomial constraint is satisfied? So I know I incur no error in the volume elements, uh, the, 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 the amount of volume. Now, why would you wanna do this? Well, those volume elements correspond to physical principles, things like conservation of momentum, Conservation of energy, conservation laws in general can be expressed in this language. So they were, that's what they were trying to do. They were totally aware of that. They had the differential equations of physics. 
And they said, can we discretize them in such a way that uh, we can serve the physical quantities exactly, even as we're doing something approximate? Uh, so a beautiful uh, concept, and they'd solved it. They came up with these ideas of symplectic integrators. Um, this has come into statistics at some point in one way that I know of, maybe other ways, but, but uh, leapfrog integrators in hybrid Monte Carlo are examples of this. Um, but anyway, it, it's, it, you know, in mathematics, it's, of course, a whole field of its own. Symplectic uh, integrals and then symplectic geometry emerged from this way of thinking. Why is this relevant to what we're talking about here? Well, um, when you keep those volume elements constant, you've actually stabilized the discretization in a, in a way I'll talk a little bit about. Um, numerically, it's far more stable. So that means you can take much larger step sizes than you would do otherwise. So therefore, you can go faster. That's the connection to acceleration. All right, so just briefly, before we kind of understood this more deeply, we just kind of did the best we could. We took our Lagrangian, we converted to a Hamiltonian because that's the standard language for this literature. You just do a Legendre transform, no, no big deal there. And then we used uh, standard symplectic methods for Hamiltonians. And there's a whole, there's textbooks about doing this. We did this with our Bregman now Hamiltonian instead of Lagrangian. And here's an example of going down a particular high dimensional quadratic. You can see you're going downhill at the, at the oracle rate uh, and you're oscillating, you're going up and down. So that's kind of interesting fact about these, uh, these dynamics. Moreover, if you compare this to Nesterov, this is on a different problem. Uh, it's just as good as Nesterov, uh, but actually it's better than Nesterov, which uh, the reason is because if you turn up the step size, Nesterov will go unstable in this problem, whereas symplectic stays stable. So everything will shift over the left as I move forward here, and you see that Nesterov has gone unstable, whereas the symplectic integrator is still staying stable. All right, so that was all kind of nice empirical work that suggested something was here, um, but it was till, not until later that we understood that we could do this more systematically. Um, I'm going to skip some material here in the talk, um, but uh, I just want to kind of uh, page through these and just remark that there are papers available for your interested and give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the other things we've been able to do once we got this um, um, continuous time perspective and put it together with some of the um, coupling ideas we used earlier. Um, and so this is in a paper with Chi Jen and Pranith Natrapali. Uh, we ask a question about, is acceleration good to avoid saddle points? And this was an open problem. As you move towards a saddle point, should you be accelerating and kind of you know, so maybe blow past the saddle point? Or is that bad to accelerate because it takes you back to the other side of the hill and you oscillate? Um, and long story short, by going into continuous time, writing down a Hamiltonian um, and so on, which I'm going to skip here, um, we were able to, to analyze an algorithm. And the Hamiltonian actually helped us with not just deriving the algorithm, but actually analyzing the algorithm. This is the analysis flowchart here of how we did the analysis, uh, which how we took each piece and the Hamiltonian guided us there. And then we got a theorem here, which again, I'm not gonna, I'm skipping this, but just at the very top of the slide, you'll see it epsilon to the seven fourths rate. Epsilon to the seven fourths is better than epsilon squared. And so we had proved at this point that um, uh, acceleration helps you to get past saddle points um, in high dimensions. Um, so I'm gonna skip that. Um, and then certainly I wanna skip over, but just briefly mention, um, uh, bringing, doing this for the world of diffusions. So not just for ODEs, but for stochastic differential equations. And so Shang Chang and others at Berkeley, we've worked on this quite a bit. Um, uh, you know, doing it for stochastic differential equations, a whole world of its own. I don't want to get any details here, but just to sort of briefly say, the lay of the land was that if you take uh, a gradient-based diffusion, which is known as a Langevin diffusion, I take the gradient and add Brownian motion, roughly speaking. Um, then in recent work, especially in the Paris group, Dalalian and others, um, it was possible to show rates that looked like gradient descent, epsilon squared in the, in the denominator. Um, unfortunately, there was a D in the numerator, which was not like gradient descent. Um, unfortunately, you're sort of seeing the whole ambient space when you do diffusion. Um, so we analyzed, instead of diff uh, a Langevin diffusion, we analyzed an underdamped Langevin diffusion that could oscillate two equations instead of one equation. Um, there it sits right there. And again, I'm not giving details, but just letting you know if you're interested in diffusions, um, you know, this is a, a richer class of a family. It's a little more like the accelerated methods that we were studying for ODEs. It's a second order equation. And we did analyze this again using coupling arguments. Um, and we were able to show a rate now of one over epsilon, surprisingly faster, but critically we were able to show square root of D rather than D in the numerator 
showing that this method doesn't, in some sense, have to see all the dimensions and get kind of confused by diffusing into all the dimensions. Okay, so here is now the last part of the talk. Um, that was just a little bit of an interlude um, for those who could be interested. Those are all papers that you'll find on my website. Okay, so uh, in work with Guy Franca, uh, Rene Vidal at Johns Hopkins, uh, we've now tackled this problem of symplectic integration. Uh, so this is very recent, uh, just about three weeks ago, we put this on the archive. Um, and I, I'm probably not the best yet at presenting it in the simplest possible way. There's some mathematics here, um, but I hope I'll give the flavor of it. And those of you who know something about this, I'm sure some of you know much more than I do, uh, might find it um, intriguing to see this connection. Okay, so we're going to be talking about symplectic integrators, and we're going to face this problem here that I kind of breezed past, which is Hamiltonian systems in physics were developed mostly for things that oscillated, like a you know classical harmonic oscillator or the cosmos that um, conserved energy. So they never went down to a point. But in optimization, the key is that we're trying to dissipate energy. We're trying to go to a point and converge. We're not trying to oscillate around. Uh, so there's kind of a mismatch between the tools we've been using um, and, you know, as useful as they've been, and the overall goal, which is to find a way to think about optimization and not just about dynamical systems, okay? Um, so uh, here's just to remind people of a Hamiltonian system, but we're now going to put in dissipation. Our Hamiltonians will be time-dependent, um, not just uh, functions of the uh, position and momentums. All right, so again, I've said this now, but we're going to add dissipation uh, because conservative systems have been the ones mostly studied. We're going to need to move away from that. All right, now, um, uh, Hamiltonian systems do preserve something, and that's actually what we're going to still grab hold of because the fact that they preserve something is going to allow us to give um, numerical results of the discretization, that we're going to show that uh, discretization doesn't lose the fact that you're converging at a fast rate. And that if we lost that, the whole thing would not be meaningful here. So the, the idea of symplectic integrators uh, is going to still allow us to do what's called backward error analysis and bring this class of ideas into the optimization world. Again, I'm kind of going quickly here, and I, I'm a, with some apologies, but this is in the paper. Uh, and this is really just a summary of sort of 50 years of work, so I couldn't do justice to it anyway. Um, but if you discretize these, um, these uh, smooth uh, dynamics, um, you can analyze them numerically by thinking about them as the exact flow, the numerical method is the exact flow of a perturbed dynamical system. So you do that by expanding the original vector field um, and uh, that kind of brings in the numerical uh, ideas into the, uh, the world of Hamiltonians. So this is, you know, Herr and others have written long, beautiful textbooks about this and, and uh, ge geometric numerical integration. Um, and therefore, you're able to get error bounds on how uh, far off your discretization is in terms of accuracy um, uh, under these kind of expansions. All right. Okay, so uh, let's now bring that together to this idea of symplectic manifolds. Um, so I described symplectic ideas as having a volume element which is conserved, and that remains true, but over 100 years, you know, after Hamilton Jacobi, it got uh, abstracted into a general idea of a non-degenerate two-form. Okay, so that generalizes the idea of a, uh, a little volume element, and you put it on an object which is called a symplectic manifold, and all that is is the manifold which admits this kind of two-form. So that it's, it's reasonable to talk about these conserved di um, dynamics, okay? So again, I'm skipping details here, um, all right? But um, now you can bring in the idea of Hamiltonians, all right? Because um, the key idea is here that if you, um, if you have an, uh, a, a dynamical system which preserves that symplectic structure, i.e. omega stays constant, uh, that happens if and only if you have a conservative Hamiltonian system, okay? So again, a beautiful area of mathematics, many things brought together here. And preserving has a difference with geometry interpretation. It means a certain lead derivative is staying constant, okay? Um, and so now you put all these ideas together, you could construct numerical integrators that exactly preserve these two forms. Those are called symplectic integrators. And you can do backward error analysis of them and show that these integrators are fast. Uh, they, they will allow you to take very large step size and stay stable. And that's this slide here, um, which again, kind of points to the literature of uh, uh, the numerical people. Okay, with that as background in my last five minutes, I think I, then I just will say that we've now done, we've, we've worked on doing this, bringing these ideas into the dissipative set, set setting. 
All right, so we're going to now have Hamiltonians, which are not constant. They're going to have a, a time-varying uh, aspect to them. So what kind of phase space do we want to talk about here? Uh, so we're going to talk about an idea, uh, a notion called a pre-symplectic manifold. It's going to be uh, even dimensional like before, but with another extra dimension. And uh, so n bar there is going to be one for most of our, our out analysis here. So we have an odd dimensional manifold. It doesn't have a symplectic, uh, um, it doesn't have a two form, a conserved two form. Okay. All right. So this next slide has a picture, which is just going to summarize the basic idea. All right. Is that you can embed this manifold, which is not symplectic, into a bigger manifold, which is symplectic. Right, and you're going to relate these two manifolds by something which is called in physics gauge fixing. It's a way to reduce the degrees of freedom of the bigger manifold down to the smaller one in a way that you preserve the relevant geometry. Okay, um, all right, so that then is the basic going to be the basic idea on the bigger manifold. We're going to use symplectic ideas, symplectic integrators. Then, under the gauge fixing, we'll bring all that back down to the pre symplectic manifold, which is now going to allow us to have dissipative. Hamiltonian structure. Okay, so a pre-symplectic integrator uh, for a dissipative Hamiltonian system is, is uh, we call that if it's a reduction of a symplectic integrator for its symplectification. All right. All right, so um, with all that machinery, uh, we're able to then set up some theory. Here is a particular Hamiltonian, which is relevant to optimization. Uh, it has a kinetic energy term, which is time varying. And it has a uh, the T term, and it has a, a potential energy which is not time varying. Sorry, which is uh, f of q is the function we're trying to optimize, and then we have a time varying component. All right, um, and um, we call an integrator rate matching rate matching if the discrete rate after we discretize is the same as a continuous rate up to an error that we can control. All right, and so we're able to do that. We're able to do rate matching. All right. And we're able to do it by provably by using this idea of a symplectic integrator in the bigger space that we bring down by the gauge fixing. All right, here's an example of doing all this. Now we're really down, we're really, now we tie really back to the optimization world. That's the exact Bregman uh, Lagrangian now in the Hamiltonian language that we had before from our original work. That works in this general theory. So we use that as our Hamiltonian, we symplectify and we get a symplectic integrator for the symplectification. And that gives us then differential equations that have been discretized and that provably keep the fast rate in the discrete world. All right, and here is an example of doing this. Uh, this is a particular set of dynamics. Uh, those five equations down uh, halfway on the page are literally what you would put into MATLAB or Python or whatever your language is. That is the algorithm that's like Nesterov's algorithm, but now completely systematically done by the mathematical theory, provably giving you a, the, um, the oracle rate in, in discrete time based on the analysis in continuous time. And here's a general way of doing this using what is called the Strang composition, uh, doing this for non-separable Bregman Hamiltonian. So mathematically, this is about as general as we would, we would need to be. Okay, so I hope you found that interesting. Um, I, I was imagining there are some mathematicians on the line here uh, who would be very familiar with this and maybe seeing ways they could use what more they know than I know uh, to help out in this field of doing this really quite interesting, uh, um, relevant uh, class of optimization algorithms and using uh, mathematical ideas. So to summarize that part of the talk, um, We've introduced a notion of pre symplectic integrators that allows you to have dissipative Hamilton systems and bring a whole raft of ideas over into optimization. We believe this is critical to do because we can now talk about the optimal way to optimize and we can start to be systematic about a theory of optimization, um, which is not just trying it out algorithm, analyzing its rate and kind of hoping that it matches some lower bound, but actually knowing that you're, that you're gonna achieve that a priori. All right, and um, let me finish with that. Um, again, this is uh, an area I've been working in optimization just because I was kind of led into it by all the considerations I've been going through, but I'm really a statistician at heart. That's my main field. Um, and machine learning to me is kind of statistics done with computational goals and computational constraints. And that's, that's perfectly fine. Most of the work on machine learning that you hear about these days that so many people are talking about has a pretty limited perspective. It's not the full statistics. It's not looking at 
all the problems of inference of figuring out what's really going on in the real world, I would just call it pattern recognition. That's a term from the early 1970s, uh, kind of an engineering term. Um, it's become a commodity in the neural nets and the TensorFlow and all that, but it has limited uh, perspective behind it and it has kind of uh, problems when you apply it in the real world. Um, so at least minimally, other than just bringing a fuller statistical theory to, to bear, we want to bring in decision making into machine learning. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, high stakes decisions and dialogue and sequences and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is a separate talk I do give. Um, certainly on the YouTube, you'll find some. Um, but just to sort of say the talk I gave today is meant to support that. Uh, this is not just about optimization going downhill in neural networks. This is about the broader class of optimization under other kind of constraints, including economic considerations, including things like equilibria in game theory settings, um, and including things like optimal control problems and time varying problems and so on and so forth. Uh, we're aiming to support kind of the unified perspective of computationally efficient mechanisms for doing uh, decision making um, in consequential domains at large scale. Um, so um, with that, I think I will finish there and I'd be happy to take questions if there are any. Well, thanks very much, uh, Michael, for this uh, great talk. Uh, so I'll applaud on behalf of everyone online. Um, I particularly enjoyed your thoughtful comments in that last slide that you have. Uh, there's a lot of hype and uh, I think it's worth, um, you know, pointing out where the real problems are. Uh, there's, there's a question. Before we go to the question, I have a question myself. So when you uh, embed into a larger symplectic space, I guess there's a payoff between a computational payoff by, by doing that or, or is there? It's just one more dimension. Um, so, um, oh, just you know, one. no, yeah, yeah, and, and really, you saw the uh, equations I got there at the bottom. Uh, those equations are, you know, just gradient-based method. It's it's like uh, Nesterov. Um, now, so uh, there's many things still missing here. Um, you know, we've kind of done the geometry, the dynamical systems, and all, but those equations are deterministic, and so the stochastic, you know, versions of these um, still need to be thought about and analyzed, and um, so there needs to be a whole kind of uh, study of stochastic calculus kind of uh, methodology here. In fact, this would be something I would put out for some of the mathematicians in the audience is, uh, you know, if you're asking about what's the optimal way to diffuse, does that have an answer? So suppose I'm trying to get down a hill of some kind and I'm using a diffusion, a Brownian motion. Um, is there a notion of the fastest, uh, the, out, the diffusion, which arrives at the stationary distribution defined by that, um, by that uh, function, uh, as fast as possible, you know, in some metric, you know, um, Wasserstein team or something. So I'm not sure there should, you know, it sounds like a calculus of variations for, for SDEs. And, you know, um, people talk about calculus of variations for SDEs as being value even calculus, but it's not answering exactly this problem. Um, but that is kind of what we need. If it's not already developed, take it off the shelf. But if not, work on it. Um, you know, uh, is there a way to think about uh, the optimal SDE uh, where we can use stochastic gradients for algorithms like this? Um, that to me is a fascinating and probably still open question. Right, thanks. So for everyone uh, uh, online, please uh, put in questions through the Q&A uh, facility. Just, uh, just a quick follow-up on the, on the stochastic calculus. Does that cause differentiability problems if you introduce stochasticity and uh, you, might, you might end up... Uh, actually, it's quite the opposite. That's a great question. Thanks for asking that. It's, great. Um, it's quite the opposite. The stochasticity smooths things out in a way that gives you effectively differentiability when you didn't have it before. Um, so um, we have a paper that would just came out this past year with Yelena Diakonikolis where, um, and, and, and Niladri Chatterjee, where uh, we are looking at uh, Langevin diffusion where you have not differentiability. Um, so that hasn't been classically studied because uh, Langevin means you need a gradient, right? Now, what, if you don't, what if you only have a subgradient? Um, and it turns out because of the native stochasticity in the problem that the lack of differentiability is actually gets smoothed out and you can actually do Langevin diffusion when you have uh, discontinuous derivatives. Um, and so that I think is actually a great, another one of the facts of our life is the power of stochastics. Um, you know, it's coming in by the statistics. It's, it's also coming in perhaps in the algorithm, but it allows us to do analysis and to, uh, to, to expand our, our techniques into ranges of problems we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Yeah, yeah, f I fully subscribe to that. So I'm going to go to the questions now that are online. So Alan Ho asks, 
uh, whether we are referring to bounded Hamiltonian systems or unbounded. And, uh, the, and does, the, does anything yeah. change if you go to unbounded? Uh, so let's just let me punt on that. This, in this first paper, we did do some. We made a boundedness assumption, uh, but I, I think that was you know just to be on a uh, you know on a compact set. Um, but I don't believe that's necessary here. Uh, but it, you know, it, 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 I, I have a background in optimal control where that kind of issue definitely became a, a big concern over time. Um, in statistics, we tend to kind of assume we're in uh, you know we have a pre-estimator which gets us in a, a you know reasonable range and, and so on. So we're not unhappy with it. But I think uh, for a general, more broad theory, we don't have to, you know, um, handle uh, completely handle, un, uh, you know, bounded cases, but with, you know, constraints on how fast you go off to infinity. Right. Um, so let me read a question by Lyndon Roberts. Uh, Thanks, Michael. Great talk. That very last discretized pre-symplectic method you showed, I get it has an exponential convergence rate. So how does it not satisfy the assumptions of uh, numeric uh, Nemirovsky uh, lower bound result. Yeah, no, it doesn't have an exponential convergence rate. Um, yeah, so what's happening there is that um, if you, um, so what ha the, the, what this approach allows you to do is to reveal where in the geometry it's not possible to actually achieve a certain rate. So if you have too much curvature there, um, then that breaks the um, the uh, the, the, in, in the gauge fixing, you will not be able to do the gauge fixing that it still preserves that rate. Okay, so there is a step there which breaks when you have a fat, too fast of a rate. Um, and so it really has to do with the curvature of the problem, and it kind of makes intuitive sense. If you're trying to discretize around a place where there's a lot of curvature, uh, you're going to have to slow down. And so the, um, you, you will not be able to achieve an exponential rate throughout a high curvature region. Right. Uh, another one by Matthew Tam, who's here in Melbourne. Uh, how much of these ideas work if a second non-smooth function is added to the objective function, as in the setting of FISTA accelerated proximal gradient descent? Um, a great question. So that's totally open at this point. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of these composite objectives, you know, uh, uh, f, f of x plus g of x. Um, and we've been focusing on, uh, you know, f of x in this entire talk. But, um, you know, I, I to so, you know, a lot of these, uh, the whole first part of the talk, certainly accommodated that. We do, you know, it accommodates mirror descent. It, and it, it accommodates various forms of regularization. Um, but the, the general theory at the end, we went back to just a plain old f of x and, um, you know, uh, using proximal methods and, 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 you know, making sure they fit still in this framework is, uh, is totally open and I think would be a very, very useful thing to be working on. All right. Thanks. Um, so uh, another question by Ethan Gowen. Um, we see in HMC that we need to include a metropolis hasting step to correct numerical errors in the leapfrog integrator. Have these types of errors had much of an impact for the optimization problems you have looked at? And thanks for a great talk. Yeah, no, great question. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm moved out of my MCMC world to do this line of work. In MCMC, you need you need some notion of converging to the right stationary distribution, right? And that's delicate. So classically, you would insist upon something like a detailed balance or whatever or reversibility. But reversibility is a bad idea in our world because it makes you have to kind of creep forward and creep back kind of with the same rate. And so you slow down, you diffuse too slowly. Uh, these Langevin type uh, methods are not reversible and they kind of are able to zip down the hill. Um, and so in the HMC world, you worry about that. And so you have to do a correction to make sure you still have the right uh, stationary distribution. Here, we're not going for a stationary distribution. We're going for a, a point. And so those numerical errors do not accumulate. That's exactly what the error, backward error analysis does. But we don't need to achieve that via any kind of fancy tuning um, a la uh, Marco Cinque Monte Carlo methods. Um, so, you know, because we're asking for less here, we're just asking for a point, uh, we're able to um, exp expand the scope of the methods we look at and our mathematical analysis just handles that. We don't need to put that in as part of the algorithm. Um, that, that said, uh, I want to highlight how really interesting this interface between uh, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, Langevin, HMC, and all this optimization stuff that I hope some of you have now learned about today if you didn't know about it before. Um, they are not distant in the, in, the, in the mathematical space. They have a huge number of relationships, many of which have not been discovered yet. Um, and so kind of getting down the hill and then still getting some notion of residual uncertainty if you, if you need that for, say, Bayesian purposes, um, these methods are very relevant in 100,000 dimensions. These methods will get you there. 
Um, and uh, if it still then is reasonable to talk about uncertainty, um, you know, you could start to blend this more directly and explicitly with HMC type ideas. Um, you could turn on the uh, correction term near the end so that you always continue to diffuse. Um, but again, I, I said something about, uh, we didn't talk about stochastic gradient here, which is kind of this intermediate notion of we're, we're never converging to a point because it's stochastic gradient, um, but we're not getting necessarily the right stationary distribution either. Uh, so it's a little bit kind of in this uncomfortable middle zone. Um, so anyway, still much, much good work to be done on, in this uh, uncomfortable middle. All right. Well, uh, thanks very much, Michael, again, for a fascinating talk, bringing so many different areas together. Uh, and there's still a lot of work to be done. So it's very inspiring. Um, so on behalf of everyone, thank you again. And uh, I'd like to um, mention to everyone the upcoming talks in this online seminar series. Um, so next month, we'll have Jordi Williamson from the University of Sydney and then Miranda Cheng from Amsterdam, Akshay Venkatesh, a recent field medalist uh, from Princeton and uh, Peter Billman from ETH. Thanks everyone for attending and thanks Mike again for a, for a great talk. Bye everyone. Thank you.